I'm so glad to be up here this evening, and it's such an honor to be able to have a conversation with Joe and Diane, who you all know and need no introduction, really. Um, but I think it is worth noting, since we're thinking about years of FCNL, that um, Diane will be beginning her eighth year this spring. Um, Diane and I both share a 2011 FCNL um, birthday. <laughs> and uh, Joe is joining us as our Executive Secretary Emeritus, um, having served as Executive Secretary of FCNL from 1990 to 2011. Mm -hmm. Is that right? All right. That's right. Um, so earlier today, uh, you all um, submitted wonderful questions for Joe and Diane. Uh, I heard some of them were pretty um, embarrassing. Or <laughs> some of them were more probing than others, let's just say. <laughs> Um, we may run out of time for those. I don't know. Uh, 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 but on a serious note, we do, of course, want to leave plenty of time for our current uh, Young Fellows speeches. So uh, we will take as many questions of yours as we can, um, but we'll also try to uh, allow a lot of time for the grand finale this evening. Um, but before we turn to the questions, um, I have asked uh, Joe and Diane each to make a brief beginning uh, reflection on FCNL and our 75th anniversary. You go first. Like to go first yeah. I thought it was ladies first, but I guess in the new, um, new uh, era of equality, um, okay, uh, here goes. You know, what I think about is what courage and faithfulness it took for somebody to start the Friends Committee on National Legislation at a time when the country was well into a world war, where patriotism was defined as being fully behind that world war. Mm -hmm. And um, you're going to the capital of that military power and saying, well, we're going to open a Quaker lobby for peace and justice, and, 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 and then they do it. <laughs> and they open up this office in the basement of the Washington Friends meeting, just three people. Um, Jeanette Hadley making the whole thing operate uh, well, and E. Raymond Wilson leading the work on the Hill and guiding uh, what would become today's organization. What courage, what foresight, what faithfulness that took to do that at that time. I think it's really remarkable. Well, I'd like to start by just talking about what it's like to come into an organization as um, well established as FCNL was when I came here in 2011. I, I really only knew FCNL from uh, being at Hartford Monthly Meeting and participating in the priority setting process mm -hmm. that we do every two years and knew about the work but didn't really know the depth and breadth. Mm -hmm. And that's been instructive to me because I feel like it's a message that I think is important to share about what an amazing organization FCNL is, that Quakers don't always know what this organization is about. And the legacy, that courage and that tenacity that the earliest uh, pioneers of FCNL had um, has, has been a, a hallmark of the organization for 75 years. And so when I arrived, I think that one of the things that I felt was pretty astounding was to meet people who would come out to meet me when I traveled at the beginning and say, I just wanted to come and meet you because I've known all of the executive secretaries of FCNL. <laughs> 
Um, and I was remembering, and I had a lot to live up to, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's a lot, you know, Big really. Here. Well, you know, and they'd all been there for like 20 years, you know, and I, was, I thought everybody stayed at FCNL that long, so that was kind of surprising. Um, but I'll tell a, 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 two things. One was uh, within a few months of arriving, um, I was informed we would be doing a capital campaign, um, which. <laughs> It worked out fantastic, uh, fortunately, because of uh, having some great people to work with. But as you all know, that it, I think, when you start a capital campaign, you do something called a feasibility study. And you go out and talk to people. And um, uh, um, when we did ours, the message that came back loud and clear, they, they asked them, what words do you associate with this organization? So this was in 2011. I think that um, Henry talked to almost 60 people. And the two words that came back were integrity and lobbying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I realized what an amazing resource that was in existence, not because of what was in Washington, D.C. I mean, that was great. We had a great building to move into and a great staff already. But because of the network across the country. Mm -hmm because of people not just who are part of FCNL now or in 2011 or even in 1997, but because of those friends who started FCNL in 1943 and through the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s have been part of this amazing general committee. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of a remarkable um, ground to stand on when you come into an organization as the leader of that organization. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both. Let's get into it, shall we? Um, what does it mean to both of you that FCNL is a nonpartisan organization? And why is that important, particularly today? So I'll, I'll, I'll take this one first. I, I think what it means to me as a nonpartisan organization is obviously that um, we don't identify as Democrats or Republicans. We identify as, I think, as, as one staffer told me <laughs> two days ago when I was on the Hill, we identify as problem solvers, um, <laughs> you know, which I, which I love. I yeah. mean, and I think, I think that really is the message, is that when, when we think about, when I think about sort of the, the very uh, foundation of my Quaker faith and practice, mm -hmm. it is that I believe God loves every single person um, with the same breadth and abundance. And so if, in fact, we believe that in our practice uh, of our faith practice as, and also in our practice of advocating, then we need to see people first as beloved children of God. Mm -hmm. So I take it immediately to kind of a spiritual basis to think about that nonpartisan basis. But I also think you can put it into a political context and say it means that we need to be talking to everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's very important for FCNL to be a, a nonpartisan in its work. And I think for many people, uh, they hear that we're the first registered religious lobby on Capitol Hill. And so, of course, the, the thought is, well, this is an organization that has beliefs. It's faith-based. And so what they're going to lobby for are uh, their beliefs mm. on Capitol Hill. I think part of being nonpartisan religious lobby uh, means something different. I, I think as friends, and from the very beginning, uh, we have been evidence-based. We have looked at um, the facts that we could be informed by that experts had gotten together. Maybe they were scientists. Maybe they were foreign policy experts. Maybe there were people who could tell stories from their direct experience of problems. And we weren't lobbying for ourselves. We weren't lobbying for, the, the word now is tribe, is used a lot. Mm. We weren't lobbying for our tribe. We were lobbying for the public interest. Mm -hmm. We actually believe there is such a thing as the public interest. 
and that we are here not to serve our own agenda. We're here to be servants to others who need to be represented on the hill. Mm -hmm. That's beautifully put. Another question was, what are the challenges and opportunities that FCNL faces today? Just a, just a few challenges, a few opportunities. Well, let me just think back a couple of hours to that budget discussion. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, no, that we're actually a very healthy place. Uh, I, you know, I think, I think this may get into a question that we're going to probably talk about a little bit more. But, you know, we're living in a time that is really a watershed era. I mean, it is a watershed era politically, culturally, communications-wise. I mean, it, it, I, I would say that the last couple of years, I think, highlighted by the election of President Trump, but again, not only because mm -hmm. of, but I think we're seeing the world and we're seeing our country in new ways, and I think we're seeing other parts of the world in new ways, and we are able to experience the world in different ways. I mean, you know, when we hired Adlai Amor to come on as our uh, Associate Executive Secretary of Communications in May, one of the conversations we had with candidates is that at this point in time, every organization, every nonprofit organization is a news organization. Just think about that for a minute. <laughs> It's not like you have to, I mean, you know, we have to be producing and pushing out and thinking all the time. And so there's a kind of rapid change about, mm -hmm. you know, a rapid uh, response to, to being uh, available and open to the changes that are happening. Mm -hmm. So I think just in terms of the, the culture of changes is one thing. And then I think that what really has felt to some degree as um, almost like an assault on a lot of what we hold as the values mm -hmm. uh, for peace and for justice. And um, kind of figuring out how to, how to not be, um, I just, this, I'm speaking now kind of personally, but I do think it it's reflects a little bit of what I've seen staff go through. And I think some what I've heard from other people too, but not to be racked by um, the, the, the tweets are racked by sort of every change that happens, but understand what the ground is mm -hmm. that we stand on and understand where we are in this place of time. That it's not only about what's happening mm -hmm. this year or last year. It is what has happened over the last 75 years for this organization and where we want to go in the, in the future. So I think, I think it is a challenge to, to stay centered. I think that's mm -hmm. part of the challenge. Mm -hmm. Well, I, a lot of different things come to mind as they do for you. I'm sure you can think of many challenges, and I think I'm just going to try to focus on three quickly, and I'll start with Michelle Alexander, uh, who, you know, has written a book about uh, the new Jim Crow. And uh, oddly, perhaps, it makes me think of Martin Niemöller, who says, um, first they came for, and I did nothing. You, you know this, you know. Well, I think her book documents very well that first they came for black men and I did nothing. And now we have millions of black men in jail, mass incarceration, as somebody already, uh, one of the staff already said, more black prisoners than there were slaves in the pre-Civil War period. It's outrageous, and what have we done uh, to do something about that? Uh, it's, it's incumbent on us to do something, as Martin Niemöller was pointing out. And uh, uh, second, uh, I would look at uh, Rosa Brooks's uh, book, How Everything Became War and how the military became everything. Uh, today, uh, if you have a problem, uh, let the military handle it. <laughs> so evident this past week, who would have ever thought that you would be violating the Constitution and sending military people to do things on our border? Uh, 
and of course there has been the militarization of police. Mm. We are in a constitutional crisis and um, it's a huge challenge. Now the third thing I want to mention is a story. We had to replace this building on Capitol Hill because it was going to fall down. <laughs> It was literally, they told us, you've got five years, you're going to have to get out. And so we, th we came, came up with the idea, okay, we are going to stay on the hill. We're okay. going to try to make the building as green as we can. And so we got Amy Weinstein, an architect who is perfect at that kind of stuff, and, and said, would you do this building for us? And she said, I, I can't do it, but I'll do the feasibility study for you. I said, great. A couple days later, she called me and she said, um, I don't think I can do that feasibility study for you. I said, why not? And she said, well, I know, what you, uh, I know some people that you, I know you call them weighty friends. She said, I'm not a Quaker, but I know, I know uh, that you have weighty friends and, and they know a lot about Quakers. And I was talking with them and telling them about this project and they said, there's no way FCNL could do that. They don't have the capacity. They couldn't do that. They're too, they're too small. They don't do things like that. And so she said, I don't want to waste your time or my time and your money by doing a feasibility study. I said, we can do it. We will do it. And she said, are, are you sure? I said, yes. We can do this. We have the, the committee has decided. The community has come together. Uh, the falling down building is not a challenge. It's not a problem. It's an opportunity. Hmm. And we're going to take that opportunity. And the committee did take that opportunity. Amy did do the feasibility study. Um, poor Gretchen Hall, or um, uh, uh, no, uh, who, who raised the money for that? Help me out. <laughs> million, five million dollars or something like that, was it? Uh, raised this money, and uh, wow, uh, that made all the difference. Mm -hmm. It, uh, it yeah. just was a unique tool for our mm -hmm. lobbying. Absolutely. So when we look at other problems and we, and we or other people say, you can't do that, that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we can. Mm -hmm. We can do that. Yeah. I, I thought, Joe, you were going to talk about global warming. Oh. <laughs> that's next. That, that's the next yeah. question. <laughs> you know, I mean, I will just say that one of the, um, I mean, obviously, you know, what can you say? I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, you can look at the IPCC report. Milo talked about it last night. You can look at the, the, you know, the climate assessment that just came out a week ago. And it is, it is truly overwhelming. I mean, it is truly mm -hmm. mind-boggling to, to try to think about how to live in that. I mean, there's... <laughs> There's a, there's a clock ticking, and we've known it. And um, when I talk to people about the work FCNL does and say we work on climate change and we work on nuclear disarmament, mm -hmm. they basically say, well, those are the two things. Those are the two most critical issues mm -hmm. that we should be working on, that, that are facing the world. And so uh, those are, that's heavy weight you know, to carry around and think about, well, what, what can we even a mighty Quaker lobby organization. <laughs> what is it we can do, you know? Yeah. And, and I think it does come back to we, we speak truth, so that's part of what we do. And um, we live into that work and do what we can, and we are faithful. That's, that's the part that I think is so important. So even in the face of these overwhelming problems, I truly believe we have a role to play, a voice to, to, to use. Mm -hmm. And I say collectively, we have a voice to use. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's, that, those two for me are pretty big problems. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say so. I, well, I would, I'm sorry to say this. I've told this story before, <laughs> but one time about, I don't know when it was, maybe a year ago, a year into the Trump administration, somebody said, um, no, it was, it was something going on at the organization, the office. And 
we were, somebody on the committee said, how's everything going? How are you doing? And it, what, what are you worried about? <laughs> and they thought I was worried about, like, you know, the budget or, you know, like how we were going to do some projects. That I'm kind of worried about nuclear war right now. I mean, you know, I mean, that's, that's a, it's, a, it's, it's interesting to have a job yeah. where you're thinking about those things all the time. Yeah. No pressure. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, speaking of what we'll be thinking about soon, um, one of the questions that came in asked about in the next five years, uh, what does success look like for FCNL? And the question also urged, whoever you are out there, I'm trying to do the best, also urged specific examples, if possible. Where's Jim? <laughs> I can't confirm or deny if this question is from Jim. So. Well, we kind of have go-arounds about how many advocacy teams will we have in five years, how many people, how many advocacy core members will we have uh, out organizing. Um, I don't, I will say this, I don't think our staff is going to get a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. I will, but I do think that if we're going to grow our capacity, we need to think about mm -hmm. how do we, how do we use best, you know, who is here and what we have. But I don't think there's any question that the the work that we're doing to engage people and to revive um, mm -hmm. the idea of like democratic participation uh, from this purpose that is a, a Quaker lobby in the public interest has resonance. I mean, there is a vitality to what we're doing. And we do training and education and lobby training really well. We're really good at it. I just need to say that. I'm not the person who's doing it, but, I've, <laughs> but consistently people tell me this, that how good it is and how, how, how important it is. So I think, I think training more people, equipping more people to uh, be advocates with their own members of Congress. Um, and so, so those, for me, are like the biggest ones. I think. In the forward plan, which is really the five-year plan, we talk about growing our presence, growing mm -hmm. our presence in Washington, D.C., which we've done by establishing the Quaker Welcome Center, uh, by the sort of power of the lobbying team that we have, but significantly growing our presence around the country. Mm -hmm. And we do that through uh, those of you in this room, but people who are not here as well, who are, who are great advocates. And then just to say a word about the media and marketing work, because mm -hmm. that's the other investment we're making, is to do a lot more with media and uh, sort of outreach to try to let people know that we're here. Mm -hmm. Some people will say, well, we're the, um, we're the best kept secret in Washington, DC. So we're, we aim to change that. That sounds great. Um, this next one has one for each of you, specific. Um, starting with you, Joe, how did the visions of FCNL's future change over your years mm. leading FCNL? Wow. Uh, uh, you know, how, that, I, that, that is a curveball. I wasn't, I wasn't <laughs> That wasn't on the list, was it? <laughs> how, how, did the, how did the visions of FCNL's future yeah. change over your years yes. mm -hmm. at FCNL? Good. Well, uh, going back to that story about Amy, I, I think that that was one of the big changes was uh, in the, uh, the idea about what was this tiny little organization that started out in the basement of Friends Meeting Washington and made it up to Capitol Hill. What, what could it do? Right. And, you know, when we used to have uh, annual meetings, there'd be 150 people maybe. Now, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a special occasion, 75th anniversary, but even without that special occasion, really huge participation. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's important to remember, uh, when we think about the future vision, uh, to remember where we, where we came from and, and going back to this nonpartisan uh, kind of thing, I was talking with Will earlier today about Ed's uh, lobby work. And I don't know if uh, people knew that um, Ed worked very closely uh, with Democrats and Republicans. And um, he, he worked closely with Barry Goldwater on efforts to end the draft. Barry Goldwater, a very uh, conservative right-wing Republican. And he worked um, very closely 
uh, with Ron Dellums, uh, first African-American chair of the Armed Services Committee um, and uh, uh, on uh, military spending issues. And uh, what I imagine has, has changed in the vision of the future is that, uh, or is changing, is that uh, while it's really wonderful to have uh, the lobbyist on Capitol Hill and, and the executive secretary, Ed, mm -hmm. doing that kind of thing, which was remarkably effective, um, what is changing now is that we've decided we are going to try to train and empower people in their congressional district and in their state to do that very same thing in a very personal way. And I'll tell you, it has long-lasting, it has long-lasting effect. And I'll just give it one, one more story. I apologize for going on too long. You're great. But this is a favorite story of mine. I wear a bow tie. <laughs> and whenever I'd go to the Hill, I'd have a bow tie on. Well. Ed developed a wonderful relationship with a Republican, uh, who you all know from Oregon, uh, was uh, Mark Hatfield. There's a great picture of Ed and Mark at the office. And uh, uh, they were good friends. And I inherited that. It was really wonderful. And the uh, staff person for Mark, uh, Julie McGregor, was somebody I worked with all the time. Wonderful person. And I needed to have an off-the-record meeting with Mark, and so Julie said, I'll arrange it and come to the Appropriations Committee, and nobody else will be there but Mark and me. And so I went at the appointed time, and when I walked in, here is the senator, Mark Hatfield, and he's wearing a bow tie. <laughs> and I said, Senator, you never wear a bow tie. Why? It looks great. I love it. But what's, what's with the change in look? And he grumped. He said, oh, Julie said you were coming and I had to wear one. <laughs> but Ed had developed this kind of relationship with him uh, where uh, it, it, I could inherit it and we could continue that kind of relationship. So when you're doing that kind of work, in your congressional district, in your state, with your own senators, with your own representatives, it really is the kind of thing that the lobbyist on the Hill can inherit. Mm -hmm. And it makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. This next question pivots a little bit in a slightly different direction. How do you believe that FCNL strengthens the Religious Society of Friends? Do you want to go first or do you want to go? <laughs> I have ideas, but... What's that? I have some ideas. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in there. Uh, at, at, my first thought when uh, it comes to me, uh, when this question comes to me, is that that's, um, that's backwards. It's the Religious Society of Friends that strengthens and enables and empowers FCNL. And uh, it, 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 is FC, it, it, it is the Religious Society of Friends that FCNL is attempting to represent. Mm -hmm. But then miracles happen and, uh, in the work. And because of the work and the way the work is done by committee people, by volunteers, by staff people, other Others, other than friends, mm -hmm. watch our work and become attracted to it. And they say, I want to do that. And you know, pretty soon they get sucked in, not only to the lobby work, but they get sucked in to the Quaker community. And the next thing you know, they're writing their letter <laughs> saying, I'd like to become a member of the meeting. You know, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, a very interesting thing. I, I noticed this with the American Friends Service Committee work, too. Uh, it happened a lot. 
And I'm a military veteran, and uh, I was in the Army from 1967 to 69. And it was the work of the American Friends Service Committee, for example, when I was refusing to go to Vietnam, and nobody would help me. And there was, out in Colorado, two AFSC people, Quakers, who would help me and did help me. And I was drawn to that kind of work. I thought, that's, that's really New Testament. That's, that is scriptural. That, <coughs> that's my kind of faith. I want to become part of that. And the next thing I know, I end up at FCNL. I was the most <laughs> fortunate life. I can't believe it. So that's my thing. Thank you. Diane? I, I agree with Joe that um, I, I really do believe that the um, health of monthly meetings and churches um, is, is incredibly important to the um, not only to the Religious Society of Friends, but it's important to FCNL. I mean, I really do think that's true. I also think, and this ties into the question, back to the five-year question, is that, um, and a little bit about what I've learned uh, at the time I've been at FCNL, is that, um, and this ties actually to the diversity, equity, mm -hmm. and inclusion work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And that, it's this, that we have to be willing to change. We, we can't just say we're wonderful because we have these testimonies and we have this legacy and we work for peace and for justice. We have to be willing to say how, how do we, what are we willing to change about ourselves in terms of being FCNL, but what are we willing to change about being the Religious Society of Friends if we are going to welcome people mm -hmm. into the Religious Society mm -hmm. of Friends. If we are going to include people into the Religious Society of Friends who are not now part of it, we have to be open to change. And we have to be open to seeing what that change can be. That, is, that doesn't mean that our um, testimonies have, we don't give mm -hmm. up our testimonies. I don't think mm -hmm. we give up our, our core understanding or practice. But I do think it means that we have to think a little bit differently and have to be a little bit differently. So. I was having a conversation with someone here over the weekend about just how, how do Quaker institutions, schools, FCNL, maybe AFSC, maybe FGC, maybe various organizations, how does the work that those organizations do have an impact on how and who the Religious Society of Friends is becoming? Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that, but I think that it's it, it's a, and it's an exciting moment to be living into that time of reimagining uh, religion. Honestly, if you think about religion that those of us who grew up in the 50s and 60s knew, it's very different today. It's not just different. I mean, it's different across a lot of religious practices. And one of the, one of the terms that's been kind of rolling around in my mind um, is this idea of a public theology. Now, I'm not a trained seminarian or theologian, but the idea of how do we live our lives in the sense of who we are and how we understand our own relationship to God, to me, is about living a public theology. When I came to FCNL, I remember having an interview and saying, I think that this is a role where I'm going to have to be a public friend. <laughs> and that was kind of scary to me because I didn't really know what that meant. And I've come to understand it to be not just public in terms of being willing to go over to the Hill and identify as someone from the Friends Committee, but being willing to try to understand um, what it is about my own faith that leads me to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 and we all are in different places on that, but I feel like there's a, um, an imagining that ha happens for all people who are it, within the Religious Society of Friends in terms of how we actually live out our faith and practice. And I think we at FCNL offer a particularly strong opportunity for people to do that. Mm -hmm. Not all the same way, but for, to have that ability to, to practice that faith. Yeah. Well, you've previewed a little bit of what the next question is, which is um, a little bit more specific. As we, we meaning FCNL, I assume, grow as an organization, how do we maintain the centrality of Quaker practice? Uh, 
And maybe well, that's something, you, Diane, you feel like you've already spoken to, but if there's anything you have to add. I'll jump in. Um, it, it, it's, <clears throat> it seems to me that uh, oftentimes uh, in any organization uh, that has been successful and has accomplished good things, there is an understandable urge to conserve that. Mm. <laughs> uh, and very often, uh, change is seen as a threat to conserving mm. what is. Mm. And I think we have to learn um, again and again and again and again and again uh, that change is an opportunity for spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. Change is an opportunity to see more clearly the way. Uh, change is an opportunity to find ways to open oneself to the light within and to uh, hear with your heart uh, what you're being asked to do. It's not a threat. It's, it's not um, an effort to throw out what has happened, but rather to build on it, to grow on it. <laughs> and um, I, I, th I think um, if we can just adapt that, that kind of, it's a kind of uh, spiritual courage it's a, and, and invite change, uh, we will be a more healthy community. I, yeah, I would just, I, I think, agree. Mm -hmm, and I, mm -hmm. I also feel like there's a way that um, it, th th um, there is some really exciting um, spiritual life within the Religious Society of Friends. I mean, I, I, I feel it at FCNL, but I have felt it as I've traveled and worshiped with friends. And I, um, listening for that and attending to that is, is incredibly mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, I think, Personally, it is for me, but I think for us as an organization, and the, one of the ways that we do that is by having people travel, you know, and so that's been an important part of the vitality of, for certainly for staff, but even like if you think about the Visiting Friends program that some of you participate in, is to travel among meetings and to worship with people, to be with people in community and in that time uh, together, uh, to listen together, to... Um, to uh, share the, the stillness together. That, um, that is a way, I think, for the organization to stay healthy. And, and then I think, I think the, the vibrant participation, I mean, I actually, I think we have a pretty high functioning governance, um, just mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. you guys do good work. And um, when we were talking to the staff, new staff, uh, who had never been to an annual meeting and explaining a little bit about what happens here. You know, there's a lot to try to explain about everything that happens here. But one of the things I said is that, you know, this is where Quaker governance works because we have these standing committees who do a lot of work throughout the year and they come and they report and there are questions, but there's a trust that happens, you know, through our governance yeah. process. And so I, I think, you know, that doesn't mean that that governance process wouldn't change, but I think that that concept of trusting um, one another in community is an essential element of our Quaker faith and practice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're almost to the end here. <laughs> One more question. What lessons from FCNL's history are most important to take into our next 75 years and beyond? Mm -hmm. You want me to go? OK. <laughs> I will. If I can jump in, is that Please? OK? Uh, what, uh, one of the things that uh, occurs to me right away uh, goes back to Ed. Mm. And he worked uh, during the Reagan era. Ronald Reagan, conservative Republican, wanted to build up the military, wanted to uh, defeat uh, the Soviet Union and end the Cold War that way. And Ed and many others uh, we're on the track of, well, let's do the, all of this diplomatically. Let's uh, have exchanges. Let's 
uh, have a lot of interaction between people in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe and the United States and was pressing uh, the administration to do that through Congress and directly. They were having none of it. Reagan uh, and uh, Gorbachev, I think it was, met in Reykjavik. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next thing you know, uh, it, it appears that um, the White House didn't know what were they going to put in the communique to show that they had a successful discussion in Reykjavik. And what they ended up, uh, what the United States ended up proposing and getting approved was an agenda for scientific and, and scholarly uh, exchanges uh, between the US and the Soviet Union. And it was the agenda that had been ignored, rejected, but that's what came of it. And I think one of the lessons uh, from that example is that if you, if you do have some good ideas and you know how to put them together, uh, you go ahead with it, even though you know there isn't a chance in hell it's going to happen. And keep pressing that because for one reason or another, you can't anticipate there may be an opening. It may, it may, it may happen. Um, and uh, uh, I think we've got many other examples of that kind of outcome uh, in work that we've done, but there isn't time tonight to go into them. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've been reading uh, Marge Abbott's new book, Walk Humbly, Serve Boldly. So that's what I would say. That's what the last 75 years have yeah. been, to walk humbly and to serve boldly. And whether it's on disarmament, whether it's on addressing economic injustice, whether it's on addressing criminal justice mm -hmm. systems that don't work or immigration, I feel like FCNL has tried to walk humbly and serve boldly. And so I hope that's what we continue to do in our next 75 years. I would like to ask a question, though, of Emily before we leave. <laughs> Here we go. Very good. So really, you could take any one of those questions, but I think the, the one that I'm most interested in is yeah. what you see in the next five years. You have history with FCNL. Um, you've been a, fr a lifelong friend, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, you are in a leadership position in our governance organization. What do you think, what do you see in the next five years for this organization, or the next 75 years? Yeah, wow. Oh, um, well, it's actually my, my first reaction to this is, um, makes me think about a, a, our really warm, worship sharing uh, session that I had this morning with my worship sharing group. Um, shout out to group nine. Um, I, <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I think what five and 75 years will look like for FCNL will be so much of what is already great about FCNL, but amplified. Um, I think that this is an exciting moment to celebrate our history, but also, look ahead and see that there are so many things that FCNL is doing right uh, that will carry us forward. Um, Katie Breslin spoke last night at the alumni, FCNL uh, Young Adult Alumni Dinner about um, uh, feeling like uh, this was a family. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, though we, we meet in person as a general committee but once a year, um, the work that we do and the um, deliberate and persistent way in which we are pursuing goals uh, is something that connects all of us, even in our separate communities and home meetings. Um, so I see those things growing um, in the young adult programs, in young adults who are, like me, not getting so young anymore, um, <laughs> and uh, still feeling the same energy um, that I felt when I was about to give my program assistant, now young fellow, speech seven years ago. Um, 
I, I, I feel, I, I shared this morning, I feel uh, so grateful to have found FCNL early in my life. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like that is a huge gift both yeah. to my spiritual life and to um, every other part of it. Um, and uh, so I guess I think because, particularly because of our ability to um, work hard to embrace change, as you were talking about, and to uh, continue to grow, I think that will bring a lot of positive outcomes for FCNLs. So. Thank you for answering, letting us put me on the spot. <laughs> it's a unexpected. pleasure. Thank you both so much thank for you. your and wonderful I, reflections. Thank you all for making it possible to work mm -hmm. at FCNL. It's oh. quite a privilege.